Hey, welcome to Father in Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift, and I'm not the perfect dad, but every day I am trying to be better. My wife and I are also trying to potty train our youngest, Jojo, but we have our excuses for sure, and we are honestly being pretty lackadaisical when it comes to the process, but... I have a story that I want to share because it's funny, and I do want to talk about excuses, so I'll get to the main point in just a little bit. But in trying to potty train JoJo, she tells us that she has to potty, and sometimes she's really good about it. I mean, she's probably 70% done, but at 30%, it's a stinker. So she told me she needed to go potty. I put it on the toilet. She had already peed in her diaper. I threw the diaper away. We finished things up there, and we're going to my bedroom where my wife was. Now, I didn't tell my wife this, so if she's listening to this episode, this is going to be news to her, and she's probably going to get a little upset at me. Just kidding. She's going to laugh, but she's going to be like, why didn't you tell me? Uh, JoJo did a uh, in-stride, slightly paused squat, juicy fart, and it was a little alarming, and I just kept that to myself. Anyway, we made it to the room, and JoJo's going in and out of my wife's closet. She's just kind of playing a the game. There's a sliding door, so she's just being silly. Well, one time she goes into the closet, and she takes a little bit longer to come out. Well, she decided that she needed to poop in my wife's closet. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was funny. It was really funny to me because it wasn't my closet. Uh, I have my own closet and she has her own closet and there's poop in her carpet and not in mine. So that's a wonderful thing on my part. I love my wife and uh, I also love funny things. And as a dad, I'm going to go ahead and categorize that as a funny thing. But the point that I want to make is that we have our excuses for why we have not potty trained Jojo. We are prioritizing other things over potty training her. And while it's really important, and while we don't want poop all over the floor, we're probably going to get to it. But we have prioritized other things in life, like we're really busy, or work, or this, or that. Whatever it is, X, Y, and Z, we've taken these things and we've said, these are more valuable than potty training Jojo. And so this gets our attention. And because this might be so draining or whatever, rest is going to also be prioritized over that. We've made excuses. And so it hasn't happened. With Franklin, it was a pretty quick process. Once he realized he could actually stand up and pee, it was pretty much over. The number two thing, we had to help him. And then one day we didn't. He just, we noticed that he wasn't going to the bathroom. We said, buddy, do you need to go poop? (laughs) And he was like, I already did. Who wiped you? He's like, I got it. We checked and he was good. So like that was done. And then Reagan, the super genius, we just basically told her, you use the bathroom on the toilet. And in a day and a half, she was potty trained. That was the end of the story. If only kids were (laughs) always that easy. Anyway, the point is we have made excuses. And when it comes to us as fathers, when it comes to our families, when it comes to our children, we don't have room We don't have time. We don't have space for excuses. They cannot be tolerated. We have to value our family, our children, above anything else that can enter into our world as an excuse. So I'll talk about that in just a second, but let me me say this is a foundation. So when I talk about fatherhood, I try and pin it down to four main concepts, communication, grace, personal integrity, and faith. Now, in my mind, faith is basically the umbrella for the other three. Faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the Word of God. If we have that, then we have a pattern for communication, grace, and personal integrity. Our communication is a mirrored image of how God communicates with us. He's always reaching out to us first, trying to initiate contact and communication. We have this thing called prayer. Super cool. You should look into it, and you should give it a try. But this is how we talk to God. But when we talk to God, we're responding. He initiates and we respond, but we communicate. And the more we communicate, the more trust we build. The more trust we build, the greater our relationship comes becomes with God. And this is our template for how we communicate with our kids. We initiate communication and contact with our children. We are transparent. We are vulnerable. We are trusting in them with information that is precious. And as they see and observe that we trust them, They begin to reciprocate that to us, and the trust that comes because of the communication gives us a platform for relationship. And the more we communicate, the more we trust, the greater our relationships with our children get. 
So we mirror communication after how God deals with us. Grace, I don't even know that I need to go into detail on this. The fact that we are alive, the fact that I'm able to speak right now, the fact that you're able to listen, the fact that we have air in our lungs and are able to breathe and have this day that we have— is all by the grace of God. God constantly dispenses grace and showers grace on our lives all the time. Even though you know good and well, and I know good and well, that I'm not worthy and deserving of this, and if you're honest, you know that you're probably not worthy and deserving of what you have today either. But God values us enough and loves us enough that He gives us grace so that we can experience the wonderful creation that He has made. The last thing is personal integrity, and this is mirrored after God. Remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is constant. He is a rock. He is faithful. He is never failing. He is always there. He is constant. And that's what we aim to be as fathers. That should be the goal. It's not really achievable in this lifetime, but it ought to be the goal to try and do our best to be constant and to be faithful, to be dependable and to have a high level of personal integrity. Now, we are going to make mistakes, so we are going to fail. This is a part of our journey and a part of our process that we're going to learn through. But as we go through this, it's okay if we have a goal to try and be like God. We won't obtain that in this lifetime. But I think we can get pretty close with His help. And that's why we got to have the faith element. If we're going to do the communication right, the grace right, and have the personal integrity right, we got to have the faith right. That's why we need these four components. So, as dads, as Christian dads, we want to give everything that we have to our kids. We want to commit to them, we want to devote to them, but we can't make excuses. We can't say, well, this or that, and I can't do this because of that, and I know I said this, but I can't do it because this came up, We've got to be better, and this boils down to our personal integrity. How much do we value our word? When we say things to our kids, do we really mean it? Are we going to stand by it? That's a whole other topic that I want to cover, the power of your word and what it's able to do. And I I know I've addressed it a little bit in the past, but I think it's really important that we become men of our word. This falls under the category of our personal integrity. The character that we're going to have, how we treat people, how we do things, there's so much that falls into this. But the thing that I want to extract from our personal integrity today is that we are committed and devoted to our kids, that we have a higher value of our children than we do of all of these other things that we experience in life. Remember our priorities. We have God, our marriage, our children. There shouldn't be anything else that trumps that. So our family is packed together in two and three. The only thing that comes before that is God. But the thing is, is God wants you to be a leader in your home. He wants you to be a good husband. He wants you to be a good father. So you're never going to be able to use God as an excuse to say, well, I couldn't do this for my wife or I couldn't do this for my children. God's not going to put you in a situation where that is the case. So there is no excuse. There is no reason why you cannot do whatever it is you are trying to accomplish for your family. But let me say this. When we are trying to work on our personal integrity, again, we're trying to mimic and copy God's pattern. So we're trying to be more like Him. Now, here's just a bonus thing that I want to share. When we try and become more like Him, we actually grow in our relationship with Him. I think of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3. He talks about... Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The Apostle Paul had a desire to be like God, to know him, to have a deeper knowledge by experiencing what he experienced. He wanted to suffer because he saw Jesus Christ, the suffering servant that Isaiah prophesied, and he saw the life that he lived, and he wanted to be able to know him in a deeper way. And what this scripture means, what it's trying to convey to us, is that Paul wanted to go more than just being sympathetic with Christ. He wanted to be able to be empathetic with Christ. I think of my buddy Derek Weeks. He's been on the podcast a couple of times, and I plan on having him on as a guest and a co-host many times in the future. But he has a son who is autistic. I don't have children who are autistic. Now, 
I can talk to another dad who has autistic children, and I can relate to them about being a father, but there's only so much that I can relate with. But Derek, who has a son who is autistic, could jump into that same conversation and immediately have a deeper and closer relationship to that other father who has an autistic child because they share an experience. Paul wanted to share the experience of suffering so that he could be empathetic with Christ and know him in a deeper way and have a closer relationship. So the point is, when we try and become like God and share his experiences and go through life the way that he went through life and the way that he advises us and instructs us to go through life, we actually draw closer to him in the process. Now, the thing to remember when it comes to personal integrity, at least for today's episode, is that God is committed to us. God is committed to us, and he has proven that true time and time again. We have to prove this true to our families. We have to prove that we are committed. Now, I understand when you get married, you sign a document. There's documentation of it. There's a record of it. You are married. You are committed. That happens. We formalize it with a piece of paper. I hope it's a little bit deeper than that. When we have kids, that doesn't happen. You don't have to sign a document to say, I'm committed to this baby. I'm committed to this boy. I'm committed to this girl. I'm committed to this child. You don't have to do that. By default, though, as a Christian, you should realize that when you've made this commitment to this woman, to this wife, everything that comes from that is yours, yours together. It's your family. It's what God has blessed you with. It is your gift. So to be a good steward of that, to recognize that, there's a level of commitment that you have to be aware of. Again, our priorities, God, marriage, children. So we've got our family, and we've got God. These are, our, these are our priorities, and there's nothing that goes above that. Now, I think it's really funny that sometimes we have the ability in our culture today to take good advice and to twist it a little bit to make ourselves look good, but we're actually using these things as an excuse. I wrote down a couple of things because I think they're kind of funny. So, I have done some manual labor in my time. My father's a general contractor. I've worked a little bit with him, and I've done stuff around the house, and Lots of other things. The point is, when you do manual labor, a quote that you often hear is work smarter, not harder. Now, it's great advice. The problem is that some people like to twist this, and they say, well, that's basically saying that you should work smart and not hard. Now, why would you not want to do both? If you could work smart and hard, do that. Talk about high efficiency. Like That's the goal of what we're trying to achieve, but people like to use that as an excuse to say, I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to get tired while I do this. It's going to take me a little bit longer, but it's going to be done, and I'm going to be okay when everything is said and done. You'll be okay if you put in the work and you do it wisely. This is kind of the goal. Just because you're working smart doesn't mean that you can't work hard. Again, the Bible tells us, whatever your hands find to do, you do it with all of your might as if you're doing it for the Lord, because in all actuality, you are. But we take that good advice and we twist it. Another thing that we do, this whole actions speak louder than words deal, might be true, but that doesn't give us an excuse to not speak. It doesn't give us an excuse to not communicate verbally with the people that we love. Let's say, in this case specifically, those in our family, our wife, our children, We have to communicate with our words. Our words are powerful. Our words give life. Our words are creative. There's so much that comes from our speech. But to think, well, if my actions are what are really going to be remembered, then I don't really have to talk that much. And I know as a man, we don't love to talk that much. But we have to. We've got to speak. Here's some biblical ones that are really funny. I've heard this a lot. There's a verse in the Bible that says, bodily exercise profiteth little. And while that might be true in the grand scheme of everything, that yes, there are other things that you could work on, like reading the Bible and prayer that would be great for you to do, but to say that you're going to focus on all of those things and not focus on your temple of God's Spirit, because the Bible also calls our body that, seems to be kind of dumb. 
Now, the point is, the Bible says that bodily exercise profiteth little, but it still profits. And that's what people like to overlook. And it's sad, and if you're listening, not trying to be offensive, but I know so many obese Christians who like to point out this verse and say, hey, this is what the Bible says. Yeah, but it still profits. It still profits. It doesn't say that it's not profitable. It just profits little compared to everything else, but it's still profitable. Don't use it as an excuse on the last one. The last one, not really anything specifically tied onto it, but just this phrase you hear all the time within Christianity. I got to pray about it. Everybody, not you know, all these people who always have to pray about everything, they use it as an excuse. If you always have to pray about everything and there's never any action, then your faith is dead. James says that faith without works is dead. Faith where there is no action is not actually faith. You having an idea in your head and not having a lifestyle that actually displays that belief, that's not faith. That's just an idea in your head. That's all it is. So having to pray about all this stuff... This is you using prayer as an excuse to be lackadaisical or uncommitted or nonchalant, on and on and on. The point that I'm trying to say is that it seems like in our culture today, we've gotten really good at taking proverbs and these aphorisms of wisdom and using them as a way to avoid what is most valuable. And I think ultimately this is pin back to our selfish desires. Do we want to be selfish or selfless? In a word, we'll say we want to be selfless, but indeed, we usually end up trying to be selfish. And we can't do that as dads. As dads, we have to be committed. As dads, we have to realize and recognize that our children, our family, our homes are more valuable than anything else. We talk about our families being worth it. We People like to use this, this saying where such and such and such is worth it. And we usually don't unpack that. But when you say that your children are worth it or your family are is worth it, there's, there's a context, there's an implication there that doesn't define it, the word it, but it leaves it open. So that no matter what it might mean, your saying is still true. If I say my family is worth it, no matter what it might mean, my family is always of more value than it. So this is what gives you the ability to not have an excuse when you have this value system, when you're trying to mirror God's integrity as your own, and you have the value system that recognizes that your family is worth it, has a value that is greater than anything else, this is when you're in the place to realize there is no excuse. And then you function as if there is no excuse. It doesn't matter what it might be what might come up. You can't say, well, my career is is really important, but is it more important than your family? Why have a career that's profitable if you have no one to share with? Why, Why obtain all of this if you lose something of greater value in the process? It doesn't matter what might come up in life. And there are lots of things that will. You'll have a career, you'll have hobbies, you'll have opportunities, you'll have all of these things. But if they jeopardize your home, if they jeopardize your family, if they cause you to not be what you are designed to be, if they they impact your personal integrity so that you are no longer the dad that your children have known you to be, Is it really the right thing to do? It's not. It's making an excuse to be selfish over selfless. And that's what we're doing as dads. We are giving, we are guiding, we are loving. 
And that requires us being selfless. So there's no excuse. Doesn't matter what's going on. Doesn't matter what you're dealing with. There's no excuse for you not to be the dad your children need you to be. There's no excuse for you to come home and be angry at your children. There's no excuse for you to show up and be focused on other things other than your kids. God is first, then your marriage, then your children. Your family takes that second slot, and nothing trumps that. Your career falls underneath that. Your preferences falls underneath that. Your hobbies fall underneath that. There's no excuse. So let's pursue God. Let's aim to be like Him. Let's aim to be constant, to be consistent so that we give our kids hope. When there's something that you can rely on and you're going through a nasty spell in life, what is reliable gives you hope. Be that beacon of hope for your kids. Don't settle for excuses. Don't settle for your personal preference. Do what God has designed you to do. Lead, love, and guide your children. Have the integrity. Have the integrity that says, there's nothing of greater value than my family. There is no excuse. And be willing to put in the work. Be willing to push. Be willing to give in a great capacity. Be willing to love like no other. Be willing to be the father that your children need, no matter what. That's who God has designed you to be. So you can do it. I can do it. We can do it. And that's the goal, for us to do it together. This is Father in Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift. Thank you so much for being with me, and I hope you'll join me next time. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Also, don't be shy. Please connect with Father in Our Future on social media and become a part of the community that values fathers, that aims to help men love being dads and to help dads be better dads every day so that together we can better father our future.